as well as you know, uh, we're very happy to have Mr. Mark Holmes here today. Um, he is a very accomplished alum. He's had uh, he's on the board of um, University Universities, a senior fellow at Pepperdine University. He's a mentor. Uh, been a mentor at TechStars. He's the founder of EcoETM, which is uh, I'm sure many people have used as both their old phones. Um, he's a co-creator of a current TV show called uh, VCs in a Van. And he's uh, raised over $250 million in capital for many of his companies over time, uh, having sold uh, some of them to Motorola and uh, Apple. So, Mr. Bowles, thank you for coming. We're good to have thank you. Thank you for having me. So, uh, here at Startup Grind, we're interested in promoting entrepreneurship uh, among Aggies here and around the country and uh, inspiring you know, the next generation of, of uh, Texas A&M entrepreneurs. And, um, people who start businesses. So I want to start off with asking you, you know, when, when you first left A&M, um, what, was, what was the path you were on and how did it end up moving you towards the world of, of uh, technology and um, entrepreneurship and starting your own company? Well, when I left A&M uh, in 87, I actually walked the stage on Friday and on Monday the next uh, three days later I was... Uh, walked into work at my job in Silicon Valley. Uh, and uh, so I worked for big companies, but I actually grew up in a, if you guys know where Crystal Beach, Texas is, uh, and we owned one of the only two restaurants there. And my dad and mom and the, my sisters and brothers, we were the staff. And so I grew up, and it was just a greasy spoon restaurant, but we got to see... The whole cycle, <clears throat> you know, I went and bought the food, I brought it, cooked it, uh, peeled the shrimp, served it, bust the tables, you know, uh, washed the dishes, and did the whole cycle. So I saw it, the whole business from a you know dollar in and hopefully two dollars out, um, and saw that whole cycle. And I think that poisoned me for working for big companies because once you see the whole system and you run the whole system, just being a cog in the wheel, particularly in a giant company where you're just a, uh, I wasn't very satisfied with that, although I learned a lot. Working for big companies is great, right? You learn lots of, um, lots of things, uh, uh, both good and bad, but you learn how to run a meeting, you learn how, what the accounting does, you learn what uh, the HR does, you learn, you know, how things are structured and org charts and all that, but you also learn the things that you wouldn't do if you were running your own company. So after about six years of uh, working for the big companies, I uh, got too big for my britches and I went out and started my first uh, startup. But it kind of went back to my childhood of, of uh, not uh, wanting to just be a cog in the wheel, but sort of see the whole thing and run a business. So I think it came from those days. So when you, when you first left and um decided to start your, your first company. Uh, you were in, in San Francisco, correct? Um, what, was, what was the uh, aha moment that you said, you know, I can go do this myself and I don't need to be working here anymore? So uh, it built up. So this is that's a good question. Um, I ended up in uh, business development. Uh, if you guys remember, Motorola was pushing a new microprocessor called PowerPC that ended up going into Macs and so forth, uh, but I ended up being the main evangelist for that. So my job for three or four years was going around Silicon Valley, and I worked for Motorola, and you may or may not know, but Motorola's price book is about this thick, and they make every product that, so if you're building any kind of system or board, you have to have some Motorola product on there, you can't, so you have to talk to the sales people from Motorola and develop a relationship. So my Motorola sales card, my business card, ended up being this golden ticket where I could walk into any company in Silicon Valley, startup, big, medium size, and say, I'm from Motorola, I'm here to help. And they would say, oh, come back, the guys have been, you know, want to see you. And, and they would immediately tell you the whole business plan and show you the whole system because they needed something from me. Uh, well, they needed something from Motorola. They didn't need it from me. But, <laughs> but, so I, was, but I was the representative. So... I got this um, PhD in Silicon Valley, I'll call it, which is being able to walk into, and I did this two or three times a day on average where I got to go see a new company and they would tell me their whole business plan and their whole, here's my system and 
Um, so it was a little bit of a cheat, but after a while, you start to see patterns, and uh, you start to get smarter about what's going on. In fact, you are where the rubber meets the road, and you know more than the guys, the tens of thousands of people back at Motorola at the factory and in marketing and stuff, because they're not out, you know, looking, seeing the whites of the eyes of the customers and the smell of their breath and all those patterns. And so you end up sort of becoming a genius to that side and this side because you have the information on, on both sides that none of them have. And so, um, and then I, the pattern that emerged for me was the big companies, the people weren't so excited, they didn't, weren't so passionate, they didn't, uh, their words per minute were half of what the startup guys, the startup guys were, you know, working long hours and really excited and passionate and uh, hair on fire, you know, and I was like, they're having fun, uh, and they have a lottery ticket, right? They own stock. If this thing goes, they can make some money. And so uh, somewhere in there, uh, the Macintosh clone, uh, Steve Jobs left Apple, and he always had it as a closed architecture. You couldn't clone a Mac. PCs you could clone, but Mac you couldn't. Um, when he left, they started to open it up, and they actually ended up giving away four licenses. And I was the guy that talked to all those companies and all of them needed funding. And I knew it was a good opportunity. And so I went to friends and family and other people I knew and said, hey, these guys need money. So I ended up raising money for uh, several of those companies. And they did well and sold. And, um, and then and I was still at Motorola. And then uh, another opportunity came along uh, some engineers from IBM wanted to start a microprocessor company and um, and so I joined and we started this thing and I went back to all the people that I had made money on the investors who had gotten into these other deals who had made money and said hey I got another deal so I, that's how I sort of got started and got it funded and uh, uh, but it sort of was a circumstance of my circumstance where I got access to all of that stuff. I was working hard, but I also got lucky um, and got, uh, you know, raised money, and then that was a slippery slope towards starting my own company, and uh, that was seven startups ago, venture-backed startups ago, and 25 years. Yeah. You've earned the title of a serial entrepreneur, no doubt. Um, and it, it's, it's well, well, those are seven I got funded. We won't talk about it. I tried to start a few others. I never got funding, so, um, so I actually started more than that. Well, that's, that's also, you know, uh, I think a great talking point because um, oftentimes, uh, I, well, actually, I, I think there's not a, uh, a career in, in maybe in the country that's, that's more romanticized than that of the entrepreneur yep. that, that is successful and becomes a multimillionaire slash billionaire. Uh, you know, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates type, and, and is just you know monstrously successful, and they're, they're, you never see the downside. Yeah, you never see that there there are many startups that didn't work out along the you way. You always hear about the guy that goes to Vegas and, and hits the jackpot. Right. You never hear the stories of the Millions. other hundred people yeah. that that went and lost all their money. Right. right. They don't tell that story. Exactly. And it's the same. I'm, I'm glad that's a it's a a good point, and I want to expand on that because. Uh, one of the things that I don't do is get up and cheerlead about, uh, and I love the name Startup Grind because it is a grind, and I'm not going to uh, be one of the ones, a lot of people do this kind of say, ah, it's the greatest thing ever, go be an entrepreneur, and it's, uh, you're a rock star. There's too many people and too many books that talk about it that way. It is a hard existence, um, and uh, I'm the speaker here tonight. I've had some success, but I've had way more failure than I've had success, and um, so it's. I don't know any successful entrepreneurs that don't do 60, 70 hour weeks. I don't think you can go. The people that start startups um, are generally people that already had a job at a big company. And so they're big company people that go start a thing that's smaller. Why is that going to be successful? They're the same people that were at the big company. It's because um, you make decisions faster and so forth, but it's also because uh, you're generally working way, way harder than the folks that aren't holding the lottery ticket and it's not their idea, they're just going in and punching a clock. And so uh, that energy and that time put in 
is as far as I know, it's a necessary component. I haven't seen anybody cheat that yet with a you know, 30 hour week and be wildly successful. So uh, it is a grind and you're gonna fail a lot. I had that very first startup I told you I started, six years, 120 engineers at the peak, uh, $80 million in, and it ended up being a giant smoking hole in the ground. Uh, and I put uh, literally more than 80 hours a week on average into that thing. It was a real heartbreak. And it was a heartbreak to talk dozens of investors out of 80 million bucks and, uh, and lose it all for them, right? Uh, and it's, it's not fun to go through with 120 people and do five different series of layoffs where you have to lay off everybody except yourself and I actually laid myself off at the end, but uh, but you know, skeleton crew. That it's much more fun to build them than tear them down. Um, and I did that, and I left. Uh, we actually had an offer for that company. Uh, two different companies tried to buy us at, before the 2001, 2000 bubble burst. Um, I was telling the story earlier. We got an offer from uh, Arm, and we got an offer from Broadcom. Uh, 750 million bucks and we said no uh, we wanted to go forward 18 months later we sold the assets of that company for two million dollars and we had three million in debt uh, so that was a bad mistake uh, timing is everything so we built value we just didn't ring the bell because of uh, things out of our control capital markets and so forth and so I'll, I'll tell you this that no matter how good you are uh, and there's the Steve Jobs and the Bill Gates and the you know so forth, but uh, no matter how good you are, you still only control 49% of the equation, and you're trying to maximize the 49%. But the capital markets and the uh, entrepreneurship gods and the whatever are charge 51%, um, and so you have to just continue to grind. After that company, I went and started another company. Um, uh, that was was a success. It was six guys, six months. We sold it for 110 million bucks. Um, after that, I sold. Um, I, I started another one, another six-year, 80 million dollar, 100 engineers, uh, blood, sweat, and tears, smoking hole in the ground. Um, and so, one of the things that makes you, uh, you know, a, a good entrepreneur is. Uh, is that you get up and you go do it again, and you dust yourself off, and that you know, persistence. And I know it sounds like a cliche. In fact, a bunch of stuff I say tonight is going to sound like cliches. And if you're like me, you hear a cliche and you just uh, you don't hear it anymore because you've heard it so much, so it doesn't even register in your brain. So I'm going to, when I hit a cliche that I think is in that, I'm going to say cliche alert. And I want you guys to open up your brains and actually listen to what I'm telling you because these are lessons learned from failing a lot. And I'd like to save you those troubles and all I can do is tell you the words and they sound like cliches. So, um, but they're not cliches, or they're cliches, but they're cliches for a reason. So I'll do a cliche alert when I hit one, and that's one. Um, anyway, I, I probably went past the uh, answer to your question, but. We're, it's great. I mean, um, again, it's, it's not a, the side of, it's not the sexiest side of, of entrepreneurship, especially losing. Yeah. Um, it ha happens, like you said, way more often. Yeah. So I, I'd like to ask you, what, what was the biggest lesson you learned during your time, uh, 25 years as an entrepreneur, um, you know, over the course of the many companies? Is there a constant that you see uh, among them that, that was a key success? Was it the people you worked with? Was it the uh, the idea itself? Was it the timing? Yeah, another cliche alert. So, um, yeah, it really is all about the the people. Um, ideas are not. Uh, uh, you know, you tend to think of I had this epiphany moment and ta da, and okay, the rest is easy because I just had a brilliant idea, and it's the exact opposite. Um, the inspiration and the innovation piece is really really important. But once it's there, it's only 1% of the equation. Who was it? Thomas Edison, uh, 
uh, said, uh, yeah, one percent inspiration, ninety-nine percent perspiration, yeah, and that is true. It's uh, you got to fall in love with the idea uh, if you think it's great, and you're going to go make it happen. But you have to set that aside and focus on the execution piece of it, and forget about your brilliance on the innovate. Not forget about it. You have to go back to that innovation well over and over and over. It's not just the one time. If you're going to build anything successful. You got to go back to the innovation well over and over and over. So I don't want to diminish it, but the execution piece is the part where almost everybody fails. You can have the best idea in the world, and there's plenty of them that are dead bodies on the side of the road because nobody could execute on it. And so, uh, I, good innovative ideas are rare. Execution of those ideas are way more rare. And so that's the piece that's not sexy. And what did Mark Zuckerberg say? Um, some, I won't get his quote exactly right, but he said, if you watch what we did for the first five, six years, it would be the most boring thing ever, right? It was just sitting, you know, they're just sitting working away, you know, working 18 hour days, right? And that's the way most startups are. And it, uh, it takes a lot of your life and a lot of your, you know, away from your family. And you're going to spend more time with these people than you do with your wife and your family or your husband and your family. So, um, one of the lessons that I think is really important, and we were talking about this earlier, is um, vim and vigor is required to be an entrepreneur because you've got to go put all this effort and time in. Um, but you have to balance that with uh, don't just take any idea and go run with it because you thought of it and you think you're brilliant. Spend the first three to six, nine months beating that idea up uh, vetting it, um, being brutally honest, go in and ask people, as many smart people as you can find that you respect, is my baby ugly? If so, why? And uh, get people to beat it up. And, uh, and don't pursue it um, just because you want to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> if you want to be an entrepreneur, uh, only pursue it once you, it's got such a hold of you uh, and you've vetted it so much that you can't not do it. You have to be so, because it's going to try to buck you off for the next five or six years or however long it takes. And there's going to be a roller coaster ride. It's going to be the most emotional thing you do. Um, and if you aren't really, really passionate about this idea, then it's not going to work. But again, that's not everything. You have to also uh, just grind and. and Work. I'm making this sound really fun, aren't I? <laughs> uh, but it's true. I don't want to gloss this over, right? There's a lot of uh, talk now, uh, and I've talked. There's a lot of uh, mental health issues, and with you know startup people, they're just working too hard and get too involved in this idea and the pressure of I took all these people's money and Aunt Martha and my grandfather, and I'm gonna lose all their money, and so uh, it really is a uh, a tough business. It's not all glam and rock star stuff. So, uh, again, I don't want to uh, be one of the people that tells you it's, it's all. But I will also say this. Uh, every person in this room, if you went and did an idea and it failed, and you did another one, and another, at some point, uh, if you persist, you will be successful. Um, and it's just a numbers game. It's how long and how hard you work at it. Um, so everybody here can go be wildly successful and build products to improve the world and create jobs and, uh, and make money and make money for your investors. Every one of you can do it. Um, it's just a matter of uh, maximizing your 49%, uh, doing it over and over, and hoping the... <coughs> 51% that's up to the gods uh, eventually goes in your favor. I mean, it's, it's, it's a tough thing because, uh, you know, the, the people that, that you say it's, it's difficult to or that you're going to fail to, if, if, that, if after the first failure you, you throw in the towel, it's you're not really uh, cut out for the job, you could right. say. Right. So I, I, want, I want to focus on one of the ideas you mentioned. Um, so. On the, on the idea of people, 
I think it's it's often overlooked because again in the, in the fairy tale of entrepreneurship it's it's the, the the founder the genius who comes up with everything and makes the, the miracle happen you know for for any of your startups can you describe to us one of the the, the key people you, who you say would without them the the uh, company just wouldn't have ever happened and uh, what was special about them what what do you need to look for in a partner in an employee uh, in executives that, that can help uh, make or break the company? So the short answer is, uh, you know, shared vision and passion about that vision, and uh, you're going to make it happen. So uh, let me uh, modify your question a little bit. It's, it's uh, not necessarily one other co-founder or whatever. It, it is um, it's certainly the founders, co-founders, um, but it usually ends up being uh, a key group of six or seven people that run, that are the core uh, management team making decisions, even in big companies. It's, you know, you have to, get, but it really is, uh, you know, the, you never have a board over six or seven people because it, it just breaks down into chaos, right? But if you're really good, you can get to five. If you're really, really good, you can get to six. You know, uh, seven is the max and it breaks, right? So you really have a core group of people uh, and all those people have to share uh, the vision and the passion, uh, because if you're going to go move minds and matter, it's hard to do that on a big scale with just one person. So, if you can expand it to you know six or seven people who are bought in fully uh, with your vision, and let me tell you what I eventually evolved to, and I still mess it up, uh, but not as much as I used to. Vetting one of those six or seven people. The core, you know, think about a tree when you do a slice and you see the rings. If there's a flaw in the you know, center, it perpetuates out uh, and it just gets bigger actually. And so that core ring can't have very many flaws or it's going to be really hard and it's going to eventually break. Uh, and if you did make a mistake, you got to correct that really quick and, and get rid of one of those people. And that's always really hard. But um, I vet my team. Uh, that core group when I do it now like I do, like I would vet a wife. Uh, I'm married and I have been for 25 years, but it's got to be that sort of level. Because again, you're going to spend more time with them than you are, and you're going to make decisions about money like you do with your uh, wife, and you're going to make the kids. The kids are the product of the stock options and all these things that are your shared pain or gain if you make, if you don't agree on the decision, right? So it becomes really hard, and it's not just business. It, it, it's personal because you're putting in all this time, and if it fails because you didn't agree with that, then it becomes personal, and it affects your family at home and your wife, all this stuff. I put six years in, and you lost all the money, right? So that core group has to be solid at a chemistry level, at a vision level, at a whatever. And it, could, it doesn't have to be people that you would necessarily even want to hang out with on the weekend or that would be your best friends otherwise, but you got to have this thing in common that drives you to your feet hit the floor when you wake up in the morning and you all want to go make it happen at the best of your ability. And they also should not be people who do what you do. Um, you don't want to hire a bunch of people. You know, one of the mistakes people make is like, oh, things just like me. And no, it can't be a clone of you because then you don't get the, what you need in terms of diversity. So um, I, I've evolved to my vetting process is I actually uh, insist on getting uh, not just together with the person that's going to join, again, in the six or seven crew. You can't do this forever, right? But the, um, getting to know this person, several dinners, have them to your house, go to their house, meet the family, meet their kids, meet their husband, meet their wife, have the husband or wife the spouse buy into the vision as well. Because if you think about it, if this person says, yeah, I'm going to join, and then 80-hour weeks, and then you know the husband's like, honey, you're working 80-hour weeks, and it just doesn't work, and, uh, and they have to leave after a year. That's terrible for everybody else that stays there, right? So everybody at home also needs to understand that this thing is going to be, or they bought into this vision as well, and, you know, I hate to say this, but you also need to get face down the ditch stinking drunk with them as well uh, so that you get to a different level because you've got to accelerate this hiring process and get to know them really quick. And you learn a lot about people when they're drunk, right? And so 
Um, so anyway, it may not be a perfect technique, but I got a lot better when I started implementing that where I insisted on we're going to get to know each other really, really well. I'm going to know your family, you're going to know mine, and we're going to get drunk together. And uh, so uh, I got way better. I still made some mistakes, and uh, but they weren't nearly as often or as painful. So, Would you tell us about a time when uh, you had a bad hire and you realized <laughs> that after a while you go, oh. Yeah. This just is not the right person for this team. Yeah. Um, and what what did what did you do to fix? That? I mean, I, I, you always you always you never wish that uh, you know <laughs> you hadn't fired someone sooner. Uh, All right, I'm gonna have to switch to whiskey for this question. <laughs> yeah. um, no, that's that's a good question. It, it actually brings up some really painful memories. Um, uh, and lawsuits. I was in. I spent 20 percent of my time for three years. Uh, depositions and all kinds of stuff. Have you ever had to go through all your emails over the last six years? You know, and I get 400 a day. And like, anyway, um, yeah, I uh, started a company and with a couple other folks, and uh, the two of them quit showing up to work, uh, and they had giant chunks of the company they're vesting every day. And meanwhile, there's these people who only have one twentieth of what that person has because uh, they got there six months later, but they're working 80-hour weeks. And here's this person that never shows up that vests more stock in you know, a quarter than this person's going to get for their entire time there. So it causes this tension that's baked into the pie, and you've got to get it out. And the only way you can do that is fire them. And so firing a founder, you co-founded this thing, firing two of them, um, you know, the problem with incompetent people is that you know, if they don't know they're incompetent, and nobody usually does, then if you never agree on that point, then they don't agree with you firing them, right? So you're never going to get them to agree on that point, so all you can do is fire them. And so um, I had learned the lesson by the time this particular incident happened to do that as, you know, more quickly, uh, but then I immediately ended up in, I had to fire two of them, and uh, it was painful. Uh, and disruptive and cost me 20% of my time for the next, you know, three years. Um, and I ended up winning both of those and those folks, um, yeah, they sued me for uh, racial and age uh, and gender discrimination. And they were both white guys exactly my age. <laughs> so <laughs> it's California. Um, but anyway, I prevailed, and uh, one of them came out about $10 million less than he would have made had he not sued me, and the other one lost, you know, two or three. But it was painful. I would have rather have them gotten the money and left and, uh, because it was just a pain in the ass. But anyway, um, for the full story, it will take a full bottle of whiskey in about four hours, but we'll stop there. No worries. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lesson that, uh, you know, you Again, it's a, <laughs> since we're on the topic of hard lessons, it's it's um, you never know until you know, and then when you know, it's 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 seem it's too late. Yeah, and we all make mistakes. I've I've tried to limit mine, but I still make them. Okay, so uh, what what excites you today? I know you you currently work uh, in in healthcare. Would you tell us a little bit about your startup and why why it? Um, <clears throat> I know you're not there full time at the moment. Yeah, but uh, so I've been doing tech forever, and I like tech. But uh, San Diego is, uh, the innovation economy is split about 50-50 between healthcare, genomics, biotech, and tech. And I've always been on the tech side, but I've gotten more and more involved in the, uh, the biotech side. And it's really exciting stuff, primarily because it's, it's helping people. I mean, uh, curing cancer, that's a pretty good thing to go do. I'm actually working with some companies who are... Uh, on that path, and it's really actually working, right? Uh, it's expensive, but they can do it. Um, and so it's that kind of thing with such huge, you know, impact on uh, humanity and on people. And uh, and so that uh, this has a lot of leverage. It's bigger numbers, and it's longer wavelengths, and it takes a lot more dollars and a lot more time. And so it's not uh, short cycle tech stuff, you know, tech's generally shorter cycle and less capital, uh, not always, but generally. Uh, so it's a little bit uh, 
you know, challenging that way, but it's really exciting stuff. All the genomic stuff, which is the decoder ring for most of the other, you know, solving the oncology problem and, um, and uh, cell therapy and all this stuff, it really goes back to genomics and the decoder ring. And so uh, San Diego is a real big hub for that. And there's so much uh, science and discovery going on there that it's really just backed up. There's uh, not enough entrepreneurs to go uh, commercialize all discoveries and they're just backing up. There's so much of it. So it's really exciting that way and uh, it's a palpable buzz in San Diego and so it's pretty, pretty interesting stuff. Uh, I started a diagnostic company similar to Eco ATM. How many guys know the uh, Theranos story? Elizabeth Holmes, you guys? So um, when they were stealth, I didn't know anything about them. Uh, nobody did. Uh, one of my co-founders at Eco ATM, who had left early on, he came in and said, hey, what if we do a kiosk that does blood testing? It's like, funny you ask, because Walmart, who likes our Eco ATM, and Walgreens has said, ask if we could build another kiosk that did stuff in the pharmacy, the queuing line, you know, just to who's, uh, what order, but also, you know, they suggested, what if you took a off-the-shelf blood testing machine and just automated it? And we were so busy at the time building out Eco ATM, I was like, hey, you know, I can't, you know, I don't have time for that. Um, and he had walked in, you know, a few months later, and I said, that's funny, they're asking you. So we, at night, you know, at 9 o'clock, he would come over with a couple of other folks uh, a couple times a week, and we did this for six months, and we'd work till midnight on this idea. And we filed some patents and built a prototype uh, thing that would stick your finger and get the blood, and it was a terrible idea, uh, the early little contraption. But we got too busy and we abandoned the idea, but we kept the patents. And so after I sold Eco ATM, we... Uh, uh, sitting at lunch with the VC of Biotech VC in, in San Diego and mentioned the idea uh, that we had worked on. I, wouldn't even, I didn't want to start a company, wasn't trying to do it. Mentioned, said, That's a great idea. I'll fund that. And three months later, we had a, accidentally started this diagnostics company. And uh, it's raised, we did the first round at about 15 million. And then we just closed a $35 million round back in April. and. It works, and it's up to 40-some-odd tests, and it's not through FDA yet, but it w actually works. So it's Theranos that works, um, and not doing a kiosk, a self-serve kiosk right away. That's a couple of big steps with the FDA when you get a consumer involved, uh, but it's going to you know, start off as a behind-the-counter, about the size of a laser printer, um, and... Uh, you know, take a tiny bit of blood, and it'll do dozens of tests, all the tests that you would need to manage your health, and it's really, really inexpensive. Uh, you know, what would cost you 500 bucks in tests and seven vials of blood, now we can do with a drop of blood and do uh, several dozen tests. And so you can manage your health and wellness without going to the doctor to get a script to go to Quest or LabCorp and you know, the shaky finger phlebotomist, you know, taking blood and seven vials and waiting and getting a report you can't read. You can go do it yourself and get the results on it. At the pharmacy, a normal trip to Walgreens or whatever, CVS, Walmart, and uh, in fact, Walmart, the, those guys invested in it, um, and it shows up on your phone. And it costs you, you know, less than 20 bucks. And so you can track yourself longitudinally and manage your health uh, without ever going to a doctor, without ever getting a piece of mail, insurance, copay, none of that. So it just shows up on your phone. So we think that's a big thing. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, everybody thought Theranos was a big thing until it turned out to be a sham. Um, but so, yeah, I, I started that, and i too lazy to go run that day to day, and I'm not a scientist, and so there were smarter people than me. So I, um, I helped hire a team and uh, they let me keep my founder stock and they're running it and they're doing quite well and so hopefully that one. Uh, also again, I talked about leverage. I think that's huge leverage. Um, just democratize blood testing uh, for the masses and make it really, really cheap and you know, in front of the, not behind the firewall of the doctor and insurance, just out front. Uh, so you can manage, you know, quantify yourself 
and manage all that on a longitudinal basis. I think that's going to be a big, massive impact. But uh, I've been wrong a lot before, so we'll see. I mean, it's it's it certainly sounds revolutionary. I'm just curious. Do you do you have any um, difficulty going around saying that you do the you're, that you're the that works. That any, is there any we don't. I don't. I don't pitch people. it. That, we don't. We don't pitch it that way. But no. But, but, that way. But it's no. Not. It was a struggle because actually, you know, when you go talk capital, uh, that's a bad way to pitch it. But it also, it's going to come to their mind the moment you say what you're right. doing, and so you almost have to present the, the yeah. There was this other snake oil that we're not that right. So you almost have to lead right. with it. Um, so, uh, but I don't. I wouldn't lead with investor exactly. Right. Just, you, don't, you, don't, yeah, right. yeah. you don't start that way. Yeah. Um, so when, when you're thinking about, um, so I, I know you, you are very involved in the San Diego's community and yep. building it up as an alternative to uh, San Diego. So, um, Silicon Valley. Right. So, uh, uh, I'm not saying San Diego, Silicon Valley, I understand. Um, building up as an alternative. Uh, First off, so can you tell us why did you move down there, and, and mostly what keeps you there? So in, uh, after the eighty million dollars smoking hole in the ground, two thousand one, that I could have sold for seven fifty, seven hundred fifty million, that I didn't. Um, I dusted myself off and I started another one, uh, making ultra wideband radios. This is an interesting story. I just discovered this this week. This phone, this is a new iPhone. It has ultra wideband radios in it. That doesn't excite you guys. You probably don't know what that is. But I spent six years, the sec second six year, 80 million spoken on the ground, getting spectrum from the FCC and uh, going to IEEE and getting standards done and fighting all those battles and building a big company. And, uh, and, and we had Intel invested and Microsoft supporting us. And they were going to put it in the PC as a... Uh, as a wireless USB, 480 megabits, you can have the USB cables. Wouldn't that be great? Um, it was the 5 billion unit market that never shipped a unit because when we finished making it all work, not just us, but four or five other companies, maybe a billion in BC money between all of us, uh, they never put it in the PC platform. They never put it in. And so we just withered up and died and, uh, and, and it went away. And so I'm sitting on my couch about a week ago, and I see this article that Ultra Wideband, Apple finally built it. I pitched them, and Tony Fidel, the dude that started, uh, that built, you know, gets credit with the iPod, and went out and started Nest and sold Nest for billions of dollars to Google, was pitching him. He was the, you know, big meanie uh, at Apple. And I pitched him on Ultra Wideband to go on the phone to be a... Uh, I called it the squirt feature. I actually had a patent app on this. Uh, so you could, say, you know, uh, you say, that's ah, a good song. Will you listen to it? go, right? They put it in this phone, and they didn't even announce it. It's a new uh, way to do, uh, what's it called, Apple, uh, what's it called? Airdrop. AirDrop. It's a new way to do Airdrop uh, faster, and then it's going to add, uh, Ultra Wideband has location, so direction, so I could, uh, so the authentication, if I wanted to send it to you and not him, just pointed at you and it knows. And it was like, oh, okay, him, that dude. So anyway, and it's got some other features. They're going to roll it out with software updates over the air. Anyway, I had a patent. They had, when we, that company withered, we abandoned that patent. But I had a bunch of stuff on that. So anyway, I'm gratified that they put it in. No, 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 I don't care. No, I'm happy they put it in because uh, I just want to see it. But it's, anyway, uh, where was I? So Ultra Wideband was the, the next company that I started. Well, you San Diego. Uh, and I got it funded in Palo Alto. We were working out of a coffee shop, and we didn't have any engineers, and so we had to hire the engineers. And I searched everywhere, and we had, I don't know, seven million bucks, and we were just three guys around a, in a laptop around a coffee shop table. And we finally found a guy, Qualcomm, who had a team, and they would do it, they could build it, but they weren't moving to Silicon Valley. And so we all talked our families into moving down to San Diego. It's a startup you win or lose in three or four or five years. And told my wife and kids, it'd be like a vacation at the beach. Kept our house up in Woodside and we'll move back. I was in La Jolla about 10 minutes 
uh, after we pulled up, literally, and walked down to the beach, and I'm, I'm not leaving, uh, and I'm not. So um, just a better lifestyle. My kids were young then, elementary school, and they're, they've been raised in San Diego. They don't want to go to Silicon Valley. It's a better, San Diego's a much better lifestyle. And I think it's easier to build a company there personally because it's harder to raise capital there because there's not a lot of local capital. Uh, but I know how to raise it in Silicon Valley, and I know how to raise it in the East Coast. So you just, I, I know how to do that. Everything else is easier in uh, hiring employees, uh, retaining them. Uh, you know, in Silicon Valley, they're moving around every nine, 12 months, and uh, the salaries are the ex it's expensive real estate and rent, and uh, there's just so much churn that it's, it's quicksand when you're running a company. It just all changes. And so, um, so I prefer San Diego by far for the, the craft I do. Uh, and, you know, the one challenge is fundraising, but I know how to do that outside of uh, town. So uh, I think it's a great place to start a company. So a lot of what I hear you, you're doing for, for San Diego, I know, I know you do venture capital as well. And you know a, a lot of a lot of the uh, fervor that you've created there, and, and it's it's now. Um, I, I think I was reading an article uh, about you, and one of the, the phrases I, I loved reading was about was um, the the get a snowflake uh, or a snowball to go down a hill. You just need some yeah. snowflakes, and eventually it'll start rolling itself. And you're not at that point with San Diego. Um, for College Station, uh, I know we'd all love the same thing to happen. Um, what do you see happening here in College Station? I mean, you keep coming back. What do you see happening here that you like? What do you think could be done better? You know, how do we get our, our snowball to carry itself? Uh, you know, I, uh, in terms of, uh, let's separate it. There's startup Aggie land and, and the startup community that Shelly and others have built. You guys are already like in first place, right? You're not behind anybody. So uh, you have the resources, you have, uh, a community, a lot of this stuff comes down to the community and the way that people think about stuff. And Aggies are community people, and it's, it's more rare than you think. Um, I, I helped start an incubator in uh, Galway, Ireland, um, and they're a community, and it just flourished and thrived from day one. And I think you guys have done the same thing because you have this community. San Diego has that. Silicon Valley doesn't have that. They don't think of themselves as a community. Everybody there is pretty much for themselves, and I think the density of population and you know whatever. But um, they don't have that, so they don't have that benefit. You guys have that here. Uh, now, growing that beyond that to a, uh, a you know giant startup entrepreneurial hub that's not you know startup agland, but it's uh, I think there's some of that here, and I think it's growing. Uh, I think you reach a critical mass. Uh, I'll take you to my mindset when I left Silicon Valley and came to San Diego, and I was hesitant, and so were my co-founders. Um, you have this mentality that you're in the center of the, you are the sun and the universe, and all these things are circling around you. And in a way, you are. You know, Silicon Valley is the center of the universe for lots of this technology. Uh, and so anything you do outside of that, you know, your concentric rings away from, you know, where the hot spot is. Um, I got over that again when I moved, after I moved to San Diego because what my thought process there was, yeah, if I moved down there and I stayed there, where am I going to, if it fails, I got to go work for a big company, what big company, there's Qualcomm, there's Viasat, you know, but there's not a lot of opportunity, right? That was my mindset. It, nothing could be further from the truth. It's a vibrant, diverse, you know, giant economy there and there's plenty of stuff to do, uh, but that mentality exists, I understand it, and people still think that way, people in Silicon Valley today think that way, but more and more, uh, it's so easy to start a company now compared to what it was 25 years ago, even 15 years ago. There's the cloud, there's software, you know, uh, tools, there's, it's so easy and so capital efficient to go start something where before you could not do that in the mid-90s. You couldn't, everything was expensive and you didn't have all this stuff. Uh, so I think you can build a good company anywhere uh, because of that, but getting really good people uh, to build that team that I'm talking about, uh, that talent 
I think is, is harder to draw into currently. It would be hard to get somebody from Silicon Valley or San Diego to come to a new startup. Not impossible, but in Bryan College Station for the next new thing. So that's going to be the challenge for a while, but I think the flywheel is already starting to move here. It's probably a little bit wobbly, right? Not enough capital on this side and not enough, you know, experienced, you know, hardcore founder types that know, you know, the different roles. It'd be harder to recruit a you know, world-class team here, but not, again, not impossible. So I think that flywheel is already, it's a little bit wobbly, but I think it'll start to spin and get smoother and it just, you know, builds on itself. Uh, so I, I think you're already well on that path. Did I answer your question? Yes, sir. I, I yeah. think so. Um, we're, we're on our way. We're on our way. Yeah. Um, but to close out, I think for, for the, the students in this room, what's, what's one skill that uh, you've gained over the many successes and failures? <laughs> and uh, now that you've, <laughs> you know, you, you've, you've been grinding for all this time and you've, you've uh, done it enough to where you've finally reached that point of success, you know, what's, what's the one, or not, um, it's not just one, but what's, what's in your eyes the most important skill one needs to, to, to learn before uh, they're ready to start a company? Um, I don't know if I'll exactly answer your question, but I'm going to try to come as close as I can. And I was talking about this earlier. Um, I, uh, and this set me free, and I hopefully, again, the cliche alert. <laughs> um, the realization that I came to after about my third startup was um, I used to identify hardcore as a microprocessor, semiconductor, system on a chip, you know, entrepreneur, and that's what I did. So I thought of myself more as a, that technology than as being an entrepreneur. And what I finally realized was when I'm actually better, the technology changes, I can go learn stuff about genomics. I can go learn stuff about uh, whatever technology there is. I learned a bunch about recycling phones. I mean, uh, that's a weird little tributary, but I learned how, you know, all about how phones work and recycling phones. Um, what, I, what I realized was I'm an entrepreneur. I can go take any technology, any market, and plug it into that skill set. I know how to hire, I know how to start a company. I know how to hire people. I know how to run a team. I know how to do market testing. I know how to do financing. I know how to raise money. I know, you know, I've seen success in the patterns. I've seen success in the failures. That's a rarefied thing that not a lot of entrepreneurs know. Um, so it set me free because I didn't have to go stay in semiconductor do the thing. I can go do anything because I, I can go learn, and everybody here can go learn technical stuff about any any particular thing, or you can hire the people that need to know it deeper than you. Uh, the harder thing is, is right, so the reason it set me free is because I wasn't so eager to just go climb, the, you know, I had a new idea, let's go do that, it's the thing I know. I can do anything. So then all of a sudden the, the ideas become more commodity, and the innovation becomes more commodity, and the, the rare thing is knowing how to build a company and execute and so forth. That was a really freeing thing for me. And so I guess to answer your question more directly is if there's one skill that I think that uh, I would like everybody here to learn sooner than later is, um, is that it don't, don't just go with the one thing you think you know. Uh, be an entrepreneur and you can go do any, anything you want and you can be more selective about what things you choose to go spend your heart, you know, your blood, sweat, and tears, and time, and other people's money on. Uh, and anyway, I hope that makes sense, but that's, uh, that was a really freeing thing for me, is to, to know that I could go apply that skill set to any technology, any product, so be really, really selective about what you're going to go do. And then you're more careful, and you don't make as big mistakes. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I People definitely tend to keep themselves in, in boxes more than yeah. they, they uh, allow themselves to think outside of them, um, especially when it comes to what they can or can't do in their careers. Yeah. Well, with that, I think we can open it up to questions from the audience. Well, I've got a question. Um, it sounds like in the beginning, as you were raising money, you felt 
pretty personally responsible. To I still do. Yeah. So I've done a little bit of that, and I feel personally responsible. So my question is, is that how has that changed over the years, and how do you, from a mindset of, of feeling personal responsibility versus, hey, we're big boys, we're playing together in business, how, how does that play out in your, your new stuff? Um, no, I think one of the reasons I've been able to raise so much money, it's actually like 300 now, um, and I've raised money from people who I lost a whole bunch of money the previous time. Um, it's uh, because you're honest about it. You're not just, and you're, you respect their money, and you're not frivolous with it, and you, uh, they, they don't just give you, you don't give them a pitch and they go, all right, I'm, I'm betting on you, you know, here's my money. They know as much as you do, and you, every, everything's open book, and you take them to the plan. Their eyes wide open if you treat it that way, and their eyes wide open on the whole thing, and they know the risk that they're taking. And you take what they need from you is that you don't hide anything, and you're just open kimono, and you don't spin anything, and you're just you know straightforward. That's what they appreciate. That's an aphrodisiac for investors is that they know that you're. Uh, you're not going to sweep anything under a rug or hide anything anywhere, and you're just going to be straight. So, um, and that you respect their money, and you're not being frivolous with it. And so uh, I take it really personally. I don't like losing people's money. Um, and I have an issue with the entrepreneurs I've invested in who don't have that respect for my money, and that's where I get sideways with people. Um, it's, it's um, you know, if you think about it, venture capital is generally coming from the limiteds and the partners and the others institution might so forth, but um, it is from, you know, the richest tier of the, you know, our society, and they're trying to recycle that capital back. And if you are the vehicle that can plug into that and take that capital, and you're not bringing it back to the bottom because you're bringing it back to engineers who are making 200 grand a year and you know, uh, people who are making, you know, 60, 100 grand a year. So you're not taking it back to the bottom, but you're recycling it way pretty far back in the stack. There's some nobility in just doing that, just being, you know, creating the vehicles where that capital goes back to that level. Uh, but you still have to respect it and, you know, treat it um, like it was your own money. One of the biggest uh, revelations I had, because I didn't always... Uh, wasn't always as good at that as, as I evolved to be. When I started Eco ATM, uh, I didn't get it. I didn't have any investors. I went out and pitched this thing for three years uh, before we got a proper Series A investment, like 13 million bucks. I raised a little bit, two, three million bucks along the way. But um, I pitched 59 VCs before somebody finally wrote me a check. And that had never happened. I had gotten raised money off a of PowerPoint for a semiconductor microprocessor that was going to take six years or 100 engineers to build. And they're like, that's a great pitch. Here's a check. And uh, EcoATM was a much better idea than a lot of that, but I couldn't get a check. Um, so I was funding it myself. And uh, I, I had no income. So I'm paying, I got a mortgage, I got kids in private school. I, I ended up selling all my 401ks. I had sold my college, the 83B college. I took the kids out of private school, put them in the public school, sold my house uh, to fund this thing. Um, and this is before we had any, uh, it didn't even did a market test. But I, I believed in it. It was a fine line between being a uh, you know, persevering entrepreneur and a totally irresponsible jackass, and I'd probably, I probably swayed over the line a little bit, but um, but it worked out. I got the kids back, money back, I got a house, and all that. So, um, but that that couple of years where I was spending my own money and I was writing it out of my own checking account, the mentality you have when you write a check out of your own checking account is different then out of the company account on the $15 million raise you just got, right? Um, there is actually a hotel uh, in Sunnyville, there was, I don't know if it's still there, uh, $30 a night for a room, and there's cop cars and, you know, 
uh, hookers and all kinds of stuff. It's not a good neighborhood. But I made our guys go and stay two to room in that place. They don't change the sheets and the place stinks. And, but that's the kind of thing that you, when you're spending your own money, if it was somebody else's money, you know, you know where we've been staying? And all that stuff adds up. It's not you spend 20% more or 30% more. You literally spend four or five times as much. Uh, and if you look at any startup, you know, after two years in, and you kind of, if you've figured out what you're doing and you're starting to basically say, and you look back, 90% of your activity and 90% of the money you spent is just wasted. I mean, you just wait. You were writing code that didn't matter, that was never used. You were building stuff that never used. You bought the ping pong table that nobody used. Uh, and you, you waste a lot of money. When I learned the discipline of spending my own money uh, on this, it changed uh, me from every startup after that. And it's a... I don't know if I'm transmitting what I, um, what I learned well enough, but think about every dollar you spend as money out of your own checking account, and it will cut your expenses into a third. So anyway, I hope that makes sense. Can I ask you a question? It's really a simple one, I think. Um, do you consider yourself a visionary? And if, if you could, just either way you take that, you tell us more about. Oh, it's a big word. It's loaded, but I would say um, what other people that join me on these ventures uh, tell me uh, is that I have I'm intuitive, intuitive. and so I, I synthesize uh, a bunch of stuff that I don't even know I synthesize, and I have a gut feel about stuff, and I'm usually right, or more right than most other people are. And the people that follow me and join the companies uh, over and over that I've done, that's the quality that they uh, see in me. I don't know where it comes from or where it is. It's not raw intelligence because I'm really not that smart. Um, it's a combination of hard work, emotional intelligence, you know, and just uh, recognizing patterns or whatever. But um, I wouldn't say I'm a visionary. I would say I'm, uh, I work hard. And I absorb a lot of information, and I have some intuitive ability that that's not as common as uh, you know in everybody. Thank you. I got a whole host of questions. I'll just do one at a time here. Um, if, I, if I heard you right, you said there was a, a six-month, hundred and ten million dollar exit in between some of the yeah. six-year. Well, actually, it was it was uh, in parallel. It was another company I started on the side of the uh, one of the engineers that was working for me on the microprocessor uh, said, "Hey, I got to leave," and I'm like, "Dude, you can't leave. I need you." And he goes, "Well, how about I still work for you, but I'll start this other project on the side, and it won't cut into my hours." And I'm like, "Okay, what is it?" And um, back in your internet guy, so the uh, late '90s. Uh, the, the developers, internet security specs for the hardware, uh, IPsec, UBsec, I don't know if you know. So, uh, so we, there's lots of ways to engineer an exit. Um, you need to engineer your exit, by the way, before you start. You need to think about who, if you pull whatever your idea is off and the business off, who is going to buy you and why. And so what we did was we realized Broadcom would need that hardware block in a bunch of their chips because they were focused all on networking. And we knew they were, hadn't developed it because we knew engineers there. So this spec was developing and we got a hold of the spec and we started coding that in silicon and uh, did a FPGA and, you know, and then when they came out in the market looking for it, we were, we were the only ones with the block and they, uh, we had Two million bucks in, two and a half, and we hadn't spent most of that. And so um, we just built it and went and laid on the railroad tracks, and the train came and hit us. That doesn't always work, right? Uh, it did in that spot. Right? That's like, you know, usually it's the, the idea is going to market, it's yeah. a long haul. You know, we call it a six year haul. Yeah. So I'm like, you can't blink in six months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, silicon's tough because it's all so integrated and there's so much software that it's 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 a moonshot yeah. to build a piece of silicon these days. So we just built a block yeah. that, of IP that they would integrate, and we were the only ones. And there, there it was 
money for nothing chicks for free. You know, 99, they were, their stock was just growing like that. And so they're like, 110 million bucks, no problem, here you go. And uh, so, yeah, the, those don't come along very often. But. Thanks for that detail. Yes. Yes. Um, so I was trying to pay attention when you were talking about the qualities of the people making a huge difference. I was looking for any red flags or green flags. And what I kept hearing again and again was, um, they're not showing up, they work harder than everyone else. Does it come down to, would you say, it, like, with the red flags and green flags, is it mostly just, like, how much people are working? Or um, I maybe overemphasize, uh, that's a necessary, like, baseline component. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, if you think about sled dogs, and you put them in the harness, and if one's not pulling on the leather, they... The sled dogs take care of that themselves, right? Uh, they self-police. And a startup ends up being that way because if you're putting in that much time, it's easy to have resentment for somebody who's not, who's, you know. And so that's a, that's a, uh, a stress that is built in if it doesn't work well. So that's a baseline, but it's not enough by itself. You have to also be effective at what you do and complement the rest of the team. You can't be just as good but do the same thing I do, right? Um, you need to, and so that's our thing to pull off if you think about it. You know, like somebody who was a double E, you know, and, and me who wasn't, and then somebody who's pursued finance their whole life, and that's what they do. And, you know, we started separating on the playground in kindergarten, and all of a sudden we're like spending 80 hour weeks together, and, um, and we all have to have this chemistry and, you know, share a vision. So it's not an easy thing to pull off. Uh, because you're all just so pressurized that um, it's easy to have lots of emotion at, on different times and bad news and good news and bad news. And is, is there like something that you can identify that you're like, this is not going to work out? Is it when you see two people interacting and the chemistry's not there? Is that some? Is that part of your intuitive sort of mindset that's difficult to explain exactly what you know and why you know it's going to work and why it won't work? Uh, that would be one thing, but, you know, it's a great question, and I, I don't have a crisp answer because it's a really uh, complicated thing because it's about humans and human interaction and uh, human interaction in a group under lots of pressure through many years and different cycles. So I don't have a really crisp one-liner for the answer to that. Um, again, the thing that I did was go uh, try to, you know, you got to hire them within a month of starting the discussion or, you know. Uh, so I try to compress a lot of personal time in there and test the relationship as much as you can and uh, see if, if, you know, if you're both relaxed, inebriated, and if some other weird stuff comes out. But there's no foolproof way to do it, right? There's all kinds of tests that big companies do and, mm -hmm. you know, Briggs, Myers-Briggs and, you know, all the different things that we've done. And uh, I haven't seen that stuff be very – it's great for burning, you know, a week of time. But I haven't seen that stuff really work that well. But um, uh, it's a, it's it's uh, it's a hard question to answer because it's it's human stuff. Thank you for trying it. Yeah. yeah. It makes a lot of sense though. Everything else that you said. It's gut. It ends up being gut. Yeah. And then you're going to get it wrong sometimes. Can I advance that just a little bit? Sure. Because and, and talk about the importance of integrity and character and uh, talk about those things. How does that factor in? I don't talk about them because it's a, it's a given, you know, there's, uh, there's, uh, I, I've not attracted very many bad actors. Uh, there's been a few uh, that have been, you know, uh, ended up in my organizations, but, it, you know, I've gotten them out pretty quick. But that's, the reason I don't talk about it is because that's, that's more baseline than the hard work, right? So, but it's a, it's a important point. Um, uh, but I, I don't know, maybe I just vibe it or whatever, but I just don't end up uh, working with a lot of people who are, uh, don't have, you know, I, I, don't, I think they smell it on me that I'm not in that. Uh, but there is bad people out there that go do bad stuff. Uh, I just haven't had a lot of experience with that in my organizations. Uh, I've had lazy people, people that um, didn't show up for work or, um, you know, that kind of thing. But... Uh, no, integrity is, uh, 
Yeah, it's so hard to hire good people. Um, I'm, I'm amazed when I hear stories about companies that had a systemic, you know, management that was bad guys, that did bad stuff, that, you know, uh, because how do you, it's hard enough to attract good, you know, people to work for you, enough of them to build a team and a company when you're doing noble stuff and have integrity. How do you do, how do, you do it when, you, when you're, you're running a shady deal? I don't even know how that happens or gets so done. But yeah, if the leadership's right, who wants to join that company, right? Uh, I guess maybe rotten people are attracted to that. I guess that's the answer, but um, I just, it doesn't, I just, I don't see a lot of it, and it hadn't been in my organizations, but I read about it in the news. Um, my experience with both tech and now in biotech is almost everybody is, is really high integrity uh, uh, people. Uh, I just don't see a lot of, you know, outright bad people and fraud and that kind of stuff. I just, I don't see how you do that. I don't get anybody to work for you. And one more. Yep. Yes. Sure, we can take one more. I guess, so as, as you mature through companies with the, and improving on the execution, is there any personal routine or learning? You know, how did you get to how did you grow through that, right? From looking at silicon being industrial distribution to okay, I've got to raise capital, I've got to build a team, I've got to run the meeting, I've got you know, so all these things. How do you acquire that? Was that intentional? Was it just running through the game that you picked it up? Uh, you have a, how did you attack that? Um, so almost by definition, a startup is doing something that. Nobody's ever done before, right? Um, a lot of it's the same, you know, building build a company higher. But um, there's a lot of OJT on the job training uh, if you're going to be a CEO of a startup, because uh, particularly if you've never done it before, but even if you've done it, uh, uh, things change at a pretty rapid pace, particularly in technology. And so um, the cheat that I uh, learned that I'll share it with you because it's a really important thing um, and most entrepreneurs don't do this well uh, what I first do now is I look at what am I trying to do I'll take the example of eco -ATM. Um I needed to build a kiosk that was going to be automated and sit in retail and consumers I didn't know anything about retail, not much. I really didn't know consumers. Um, and I knew nothing about kiosk um, or the phone business. But I, I liked my idea that if we automated this, paid people cash on the spot, and put it in the normal path, you know, grocery store, they would be, a lot of people would use it. And that turned out to be a good assumption. It turned out it worked. Um, but consumer is really notoriously hard. There's lots of dead bodies on that. It's hard to know what's going to work with consumers. It's such a complicated process. Retail, really tough, right? Uh, kiosk, we could figure out the technology. I didn't know it, but I could go figure that out. Uh, for the phone market, use phones. Where the hell they go and who does that, right? So break the so here's what I did. Break the business down into components, into its ingredient parts. Uh, uh, phone recyclers and refurbishers. What, what do they do? I went and investigated them. I went and met with them. Um, kiosk. Who's the Elvis of kiosk? Uh, the biggest kiosk that was out at the time uh, before Redbox was Coinstar. All right, who started Coinstar? I got on LinkedIn, looked him up, called him up. Uh, he gave me about five minutes or a minute and a half the first time. Uh, he had sold, he actually had taken it public. And uh, anyway, I talked myself into his office in Seattle. I, flew, I said, I'll be there next Thursday. I wasn't going there at all, but I flew up uh, and sat in his lobby till he uh, gave me a few minutes. He said, All right, I got 10 minutes. I got to go. I ended up walking out of his office three hours later, and he uh, agreed to invest and sit on my board. 
Um, so what are the components of your business? And then go find the Elvis of each of those. Who knows uh, retail? I found the guy that found a price club and the guy a uh, uh, big shot at Best Buy um, and somebody from Walgreens. And so find the Elvis of what are the ingredients of your business? Who's the Elvis of the channel? Who's the Elvis, you know, done it in the past? And you would be surprised. So what you're trying to do is take the smartest people about every, the real world experience, about every component of your business. They have synapses and memory and experiences in their brain. You want those from their brain to go into your brain. And you want, you know, the, all those Elvises to impart that on you. You can go learn that stuff the hard way, OJT, or you can simply go ask them, and they will usually tell you. They, if they just spent their life or a good portion of it doing this thing and got so good at it, you punch the button and they will tell you. They will just tell you, and they will probably join your cause. And if they won't go, they know the, who's not Elvis, who's the next guy, you know, the second, yeah, and they know oh, my executive He's the best guy in operations that knows all about key. So I went out and synthesized, you know, got all those people involved, asked them to join my board or advisory board to invest, plugged into their networks, and then, you know, a year later, now I've collected the, all the smartest chunks of those brains, and I knew more about what I am doing recycling phones in a kiosk consumer retail than anybody on the planet. Uh, and I didn't learn it the hard way, I learned it, I learned some of it the hard way, but I learned it by going and, and seeking out those people. So don't be afraid to just pick up the phone and find somebody on LinkedIn or internet that you think would never talk to you, that you think knows everything you need to know, and they will probably talk to you nine times out of ten and do that. And that's the biggest cheat there is, is to just go have everybody that's smart tell you what to do. You still got to filter it and find the Elvis and make a mistake, but uh, anyway, I hope that answers your question. It's amazing how much people are willing to help if you just ask. Yep, exactly. It's, it's surprising. Yep. Well, uh, Mr. Bull, uh, Mr. Bulls, thank you so much for coming. It's been Thanks great for having me. Uh, I know we started growing as a whole, and you know, everyone in Aggieland loves having you here. Um, you know, continue to inspire, every, uh, inspire everybody at uh, the start of Baggy Land and, and you know, the next generation of, of Texas A&M entrepreneurs. Thank you. Thank you again. Thanks, All right, guys. can you get a round of applause for